You ready to go home? Me neither. Y'all still awake? So, um, you all have already heard the word of the Lord this morning. He is coming after dead things. And he saved you a seat. So if you feel like that your dry bones are disqualifying you from your seat, he showed up for you this morning. So this morning, um, I got to do something that I normally like to do. Um, but I'm kind of coming to the grips with we're just not normal. <laughs> I got one. So um, I like to have something new and fresh. And but all week long, I've had one thing continue going through my mind. I'm his poem. It's been on my mind all week. Every time I tried to pray about the service, that's what come back up. And I was like, no, God, let me explain to you that Last week was about the poem. I'm trying to pray about next week. Like, what, am I, what, what do you want to do next Sunday? Cody, you're my poem. So I fought it for a while. And um, so last night, an, or over the weekend, I, God began to give me just one word. And I was like, all right, here we go. I'm finally getting my message. Here's my word. And it was the word align. Align. To get into alignment. But then he wouldn't let me forget poem either. So I was like, uh, I don't know about this. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians 2, 10 says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. So I read that this week and over the weekend. And then I begin to hear Holy Spirit just saying a line and poem. And I was like, I don't know if you know this or not, God, but them two things don't go together at all. Like chocolate syrup and tuna fish. They're both good. Don't go together. So... um. I sit down last night, and, and I, I, I begin to look up a line. I was like, I'm going with it. I'm going for a line. We're going to go with this direction. And did you know that nowhere in the King James Version, New King James Version, New Living, or the ESV is the word a line? I know. I looked. I searched it. I Googled it. I used Strong's Concordance. I used version. It ain't in there. I'm like... Now what? So, I really began to pray about it this weekend. I just really feel like God's saying, you break this verse down, and I'll show you. You just break the verse down, and I'll show you. So this may be a little teachy this morning. And it may be a minute. We may be here a minute. But it'll be all right. That just means the lines at the restaurant will be gone. You'll be able to walk right in. Hallelujah. So, verse 10. Thank you, baby. Verse 10 starts out with the word for. And I love it when God shows things like this. Because normally, most studies that I've done, whenever you read the word for, it's usually the Greek word ice. It's spelled just like we spell our ice, I-C-E. It's the Greek word ice, and it means for. 
This time, when it starts out with the word for, it starts out with the Greek word gar, G-A-R, just like the ugly fish. Gar. And it doesn't exactly mean, it can mean for, but most of the time, whenever you read it, it's the words and or because. So, the verse would start out, because we are his workmanship. So any time that a verse starts out with a conjunction, conjunction, junction, what's your function? Y'all remember Schoolhouse Rock? Sorry. All right. Went back a little too far for some of you. So any time a verse starts with a conjunction, that means there's something ahead of that that you need to pay attention to, right? Okay. So y'all want to get with me. So it starts out with, because we are his workmanship, because we are his masterpiece. Well, what's it say before that? Well, it's kind of amazing because a lot of times we have these, what I, what I like to call like memory verses, like verses that we memorize. We don't always know the full context of it, but we know that one verse. So a lot of people know this verse. We are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece. And two verses ahead of this, a lot of people know that verse. For it's by grace we are saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. A lot of people know verse 8, and a lot of people know verse 10. Not a lot of people know that Paul put them together. Did you know that? I didn't either. <laughs> Whew. We're going to start doing jumping jacks, get everybody woke up. Okay, so verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast, because we are his workmanship. Now, when I was studying this, it blew my mind. So I'm praying that this comes across the way God showed it to me, because I know my mind doesn't work like normal people's minds. So when I read this verse, For we are his workmanship. I always put the emphasis of the sentence on workmanship. That's like the key word in the sentence. For we are his workmanship. But then if you back up and put the whole thing in there together, for we are saved by grace through faith, it is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, because we are his workmanship. See, when you read the whole thing together, it takes the emphasis off of workmanship and puts the emphasis on His. So God began to show me this weekend, I've had this on your mind all week long, because I want you to get to the point to where you realize that you're my poem, and whenever you finally get that revelation set in your mind that you're my poem, I'm then going to give you the revelation that it's not about the poem, it's about the poet. It's not about the workmanship. It's not about the gift. It's about the gift giver. We are saved by grace through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, because you are His workmanship. We, we learned last week that workmanship is the Greek word... It even sounds like poem. I didn't even know. It's crazy. It's like, it's spelled P-O-I-E-M-A. Poema. Literally means to make, or poem, or poetry. The word signifies that which is manufactured, a product, or a design produced by an artisan. So I'll tell you what. Let's just read that together. Is that all right? I got to get y'all talking to me. We're going to read 8, 9, and 10, but when you get to 10, we're not going to say 4. We're going to say because. I think there's power in you speaking it. All right? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, because we are his workmanship. I don't know about you, that blew my mind this weekend. So, the next word. For we are his workmanship. We are his poem. He is the poet, I am the poem. The next word is the word created. 
created. And this is the word, I don't know how to say it. A lot of times I can try to halfway figure these out because if you look in the Strong's, it'll have what it is in Greek. And then it'll have like a little slash. And then it'll give out the, what is it called? Pronunciation. Thank you. And it'll tell you how to pronounce it. Even in the pronunciation, this one doesn't make sense. It's the word kidizo, but it's spelled K-T-I-D-Z-O. Now, how do you make the sound K-T-I-D? Okay, kidizo. And it means to fabricate. To fabricate. Now, once again, you've got to stay with me because this is where I got my mind got blown the second time. So, I've learned something working with Randy over the past two years. Randy comes from like a mechanic, machine tool background. And to fabricate is different than to build. I looked it up. I looked up the definition just to make sure my mind was in the right place. But to fabricate, according to Merriam-Webster, is to construct from diverse and usually standard parts. To fabricate. We're going to make something, but we're just going to use what we have on hand to make it. So you are fabricated by God. Made up of different parts that He has placed together to serve His purpose. Man, we could go really deep into that. We are His workmanship, fabricated from different things, but fabricated into Christ Jesus. That word, in, is actually the Greek word, in, but a lot of times the the translation of that is into. So y'all stay with me. I know it's a lot. But because we are His workmanship, fabricated into Christ Jesus. So he has taken all of my different things and he is working them together to form me into the image of his son. Y'all, y'all with me? I'm getting a few head nods. Okay, people are starting to get it. So this is something that, that God began to give me whenever I was praying over this. He's like, stop looking at other people And thinking, well, I don't have the same qualities that they do, so therefore I'm not as useful as they are. They was fabricated with different things than what I'm being fabricated to, but the end result is always the same. I've seen Randy at work, they need a part for a piece of a machine, and he go get something that's not even close to being anything near what that machine's supposed to be made out of, and he begins to fabricate it until it's useful to the point that we need it to, to get the job done. God, I'm not smart enough, I don't have enough experience, I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm this, I'm that. God's saying, I'm taking the thing that, not, that you see as having no purpose, and I'm fabricating it into something that looks like my son. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, I'm going to get ahead of myself. I already have. So the next words, created in Christ Jesus, were fabricated into Christ Jesus for good works. Amen? Now remember, it just said in verse 9, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That is the same Greek word. Both works. Same Greek word. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Because we are His workmanship, fabricated in Christ, into Christ Jesus for good works. Now, this time the word for is a completely different Greek word. It ain't ice or gar. It's a word that I had never seen before. When I looked it up, it's, it is the Greek word. I forgot to write down what the Greek word was. But the Greek word means, this is what the definition said, superimposition. That's what the definition was. Superimposition. And I'm sitting there reading that going, well, great. 
I want to know right offhand, how many of you know what superimposition is? Yeah, I had no idea. So I looked up the definition, and I still didn't get it. So I typed in into Google, examples of superimposition. And I finally got one example that part of the way made sense. So the actual definition is, is to place something on top of something else in order to change the outcome. So in photography, a lot of times they'll use superimposition where they'll take one negative and put another negative on top of it and change what the picture looks like. Right? Okay, so uh, Mr. Bubby, I got my, my PowerPoint. This is the most basic example I could find on Google. What shape is that? It's a triangle. So if we superimpose another triangle on top of it, upside down, we get this. It's a, I know that's a religious symbol, but we're just looking at shapes, okay? Just shapes. So you got the one. Superimposition is putting something on top of it to change the overall picture. Okay. Because you are his poem being fabricated into Christ Jesus. So if the first triangle was me and the second triangle is Jesus, he is superimposing him on top of me to change me into him. Okay, this was mind blown number three for me. Like I'm sitting at my desk going, are you serious? That, all that was in that little word for. Because we are his workmanship, because I am his poem, I'm being fabricated into Jesus by God literally putting Jesus over top of me. That is why it says I'm under the blood. Why? Because the blood has been applied unto me that now I look different to the Father. Okay, Whew. look at this. I'll show you another place where this word, I can't believe I forgot to write down what that word was, where this Greek word was used. It was actually used in Matthew 3.16, the same Greek word that means superimposition. Then it says this, when he had been baptized, speaking of Jesus, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting Upon him. That word upon is the same Greek word that means superimpose. Epi. That's it, epi, because I remember thinking epipen. I don't know why. That's just how my mind works. So the Greek word is epi. So Jesus gets baptized. He goes down into the water, comes up. The spirit descends like a dove and literally superimposes on top of him. So when you're baptized by the Holy Spirit, it literally comes down and changes you. Y'all with me? All right. Superimpose. So, all this is in this verse. It blew my mind. Because we are His workmanship, because I am His, His, His poem, fabricated into Christ Jesus, superimposed for good works. Now look at this. This part blew my mind. Because I've, I've quoted this scripture before about me being his workmanship. Never realized what the rest of the verse said. I didn't memorize the whole verse. I'm bad about that. I stop short sometimes. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That God prepared beforehand. Prepared beforehand, beforehand is all one word, one Greek word. Proet yomatso. Proet yomatso. So the Greek word pro is the same as our English word pre. It just means before. The Greek, if we say pre. Destined, destined before. So the Greek word pro is the same as our word pre. 
Himetso means to prepare or provide. It was prepared or provided before. So look at this. And, and we're going to jump around for the next few minutes all over the Bible, and I don't have any markers, so this may take just a minute. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 46, verse 10. Isaiah 46, 10 says this, Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So God declared the end from the beginning. God declared the end from the beginning. Now wrap your mind around this. God declared Revelation 22 whenever Genesis 1 was being written. So what's that got to do with the rest of this stuff? Glad you asked. We made a statement last Sunday. I'm his poem, and my poem's still being written. Wrote. Written or wrote? Written. Written. My poem is still being written. And I made that statement. But I had, I had an inferior view of what that really means. Because I was thinking of it as, as I go along, he is writing my story. He declares the end from the beginning. So that means he wrote my chapter 10 and is working his way back. So my story's still being written, but God's not trying to figure it out as I go. Come on, God's got a plan. God's a planner. I'm not. I am like 100% spontaneous, on the moment. I think of plan B whenever I realize plan A is not working. That's why he put me with Erica. Because Erica knows when we're going to run out of toothpaste in like 2015, 2025. Let's say 20, that's, that's a little better, 2025. Like she got that planned out. I'm not a planner. God's saying, listen, I've... Your poem is still being written, but I've already declared the end. So what parts are, is he still writing? So that's what I began to ask God. Okay, so if the end is already written, what are you writing now? Because I, st- I firmly believe that the pen's still in his hand. So what is he writing now? And you know what he showed me this morning during Sunday school? Because I didn't have an answer to this during Sunday school. This morning during Sunday school, God showed me, listen, the times that I'm writing on your poem is the times that you veer off and I'm getting you back into alignment with my story. I've already wrote the end of your poem and I love you too much to take away your free will. So the times that you veer off from your story, I pick up my pen and I write your return. I write your alignment back in with the end of your story. The Father, listen, we've made this statement before, but we're going to go just a little different direction with it. The Father never called the prodigal son prodigal. Why? Because the Father already knew the story that the son was going to be an heir. He picked up his pen to write the son back on the road home. God's already wrote the end of your story. That's how we can stand and say, I trust you in the battle. Because we know he's already wrote the victory to the battle. It's my job to stay in alignment with where my story is written. And I can take hope in that, and I can take pleasure and joy in knowing that I have a good, good father, that if I do veer off and I do sway and and swerve off of the beaten path that I'm supposed to be on, he's going to reach down and pick up his pen, and he's going to write me back into my story.
Oh, my goodness. Ephesians, I do this all the time. I write down a verse, and I don't remember why. Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. Before the foundation of the world, He wrote the end of your story. How many of you know that that How many of you know that Jesus Christ was prepared as the sacrificial lamb before Adam fell? Jesus Christ was prepared for the sacrificial lamb before they ever eat of the fruit. You're not surprising God. You're not catching him off guard. He's not writing your story and then all of a sudden like, "Ah, you ruined it." What am I going to do now? He just picks up his pen. And he draws your little GPS map back into his line. (laughs) Revelations 13.8. I told you we were going to jump around quite a bit. Revelation 13, 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's where it talks about the lamb being slain from the foundation of the world. So before the world was ever even created, before he said, let there be light, Jesus had already been prepared as a sacrifice for your sin. So God is not saying, oh my goodness, Cody messed up again. What am I going to do? Listen, you may have blown it. Like historically just blew it. But the pen's still in his hand. And he's writing you back to the end of your story that he had written before you were ever born. I know that's hard to wrap your mind around. I know that's hard to, 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 to get into your spirit. But he's saying, listen, how many, of you ever, how many of you ever uttered these words? I want to do more for him, but I'm just afraid I'm going to mess up. You may not have said it out loud, but you've thought about it. I don't want to do the wrong thing. Right? I, I mean, like, I would love to just go for it, and, but I don't want to, like, be a hindrance to nobody, and I don't want to... I don't want to step out there and then it be me and not him. Let me, let me tell you this. He wrote the end of the story already. What does that mean? That means if your eyes are on him and you're trying to please him, you couldn't mess it up if you tried. Why? Because he's got the pen in his hand. He's like, well, Cody's trying. He's still heading in the right direction. I'll just veer him right back on his story. You know, I, I think about it like this. I, I praise God that he doesn't sit up there on his throne with one of them giant pink erasers, and every time I mess up, he just goes, because that's what I deserve. He's already written the end of my story, and it is victory, and it is life eternal with my Father. That's the end of my story that he's already written, and every time I veer off, he has every right to just erase that out of history. But he doesn't. He picks up the quill. I just I envision it's got to be a quill, like a big feather on it. And he writes me right back into my story. So, this is where God really began to put it together. This is why I had in my mind poem and a line. Because my poem is finished, but yet it's still being written. I know, that only works in the kingdom. It doesn't work in the world. The end of it's done. It's completed. You got the little dot at the end. It's finished. It's already signed. 
but it's still being written. But God's saying, I am trying my best every moment to get you back into a line with your story. Not the story that the world wrote for me. I love you, Dad, but not even the story that Dad wrote for me. The story that he wrote for me. So, I kind of stumbled across something that I really, really liked, and, and I hope, once again, that you understand Paul ended a lot of his letters the same way to the churches. And we're going to look where he, he uh, ended 2 Corinthians, the second letter to the church in Corinth. Verse, I mean, chapter 13, verse 11. He says this, Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Become complete. That's not it. So, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. So Paul tells him, and, and if you look, it's kind of different wording in English, but a lot of times it's this same Greek word for complete. And it's the Greek word katartizo. Sounds kind of Italian. Sounds like something you get on your pizza. It's like katartizo. Uh, maybe that's just me. Catartizo, it means to complete thoroughly, to repair or adjust. To repair or adjust. So I began to do some research on this, and this is the word that they would use for like a chiropractic adjustment. To get you back in alignment. It's the same word that they would use if, like, I don't know, you're in a bounce house with Jacob, and you get your shoulder knocked out of socket. It's the same word they would use to, to pop your shoulder back into place. It's catartizo. To put back into alignment. To snap it back into alignment. So Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. And, and Paul is saying, listen, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Get back in alignment. Stay in alignment. Because the end of your story has already been written. Listen, th th listen, I hope you get this, how freeing this is. If the end of your story's already wrote, Randy, you don't have to try to figure it out. You're not responsible for writing the end of your story. You're free of that. You just walk in alignment. Cody, where are you going to be in this time next year? I have no idea. That's not my job to figure out. It's my job to walk in alignment with what my story says. And God says, you know what? Sometimes it hurts. Listen, I, I've never had anything like out of socket. <sighs> well, I'm, well, I promise one of these days I'm going to get better analogies. Anybody ever seen the movie Friday Night Lights? About the football team? The Panthers? So there's, I forget the guy's name, but there's one part at the very end, they're in the championship game, and the fullback runs through, and he gains a bunch of yards, but he knocks his shoulder out of socket. Y'all remember that? And they take the dude, and they lay him on his face on a table, and they put a towel in his mouth for him to bite on, and they grab his arm and like, and he goes, Rawr! and he grabs his helmet and gets back on the field. Rawr! Like that. Popped it. I, I, I don't know, but I would say that hurt. Sometimes it hurts to get snapped back into alignment. But that's the way you get back in the game. Come on, you got two choices. you got two choices. The enemy attacks you and knocks you out of alignment. You can either sit on the sideline for the rest of the championship, or you can get that thing back in alignment and get back in the game. And God's saying, listen, what do I want to do with you this morning? I don't want you to sit there in pain on the sideline. Let me get you back into alignment. Let me catartizo you and get you and snap that thing back into alignment so you can get on with living your story. So you can get on with being the poem that you're supposed to be. Listen, God, God wrote the end of your poem, and I refuse to believe that he just pulled it out of a hat one day and said, okay, this is going to be it. Come on, when Walt Whitman wrote his poetry, 
Do you think he just sat down and like was in college and, and, and forgot about the assignment till the morning of and is trying to just put something on paper real quick to turn into the teacher? Do you think that's what made his books? No. Thought and consideration and, and, and meditation went into setting down and, and just pouring out this work of art. And God's saying, that's exactly what I did for you. So watch this. We're going to look at a few of these, and then I'm done. I'll get out of the way. To snap back into alignment. Katartizo. And over in Matthew 21. Matthew 21. I hope this, I hope, I hope you, this blows your mind, because it got me too. Matthew 21, 16. We'll read 15 too. That way we don't start on a conjunction. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, he being Jesus, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. My Bible says mad. And said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read... Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. That word perfected is the word katartizo. Out of the mouth of babes, praise is being snapped back into the alignment of what it was originally intended for. You must come as a child. Why? Because when you come to him as a child, you begin to have unhindered praise. And that snaps back into alignment of what praise was originally meant for. Like a bone being set. Sometimes you get a little crooked. Oh my goodness. That, God just reminded me of this. Whenever we was playing Little League football, Billy broke his arm. And, like, he landed on a dude like this over his back, and another dude landed here. And Billy was laying on his back on the football field, and he had two elbows, didn't he? I swear, he went out like this, and then down, and then come right back in. A com- like a perfect square. So when they got to the hospital, you tell, me, tell me if I'm wrong. When they got him to the hospital, they put his fingers in this little Chinese trap thing that held his fingers... And they put a five-gallon bucket on his bicep and started filling it with water until it pulled them bones back into alignment. That sounds gross, don't it? (laughs) But, But God's saying, listen, I'm doing whatever is necessary and whatever it takes to get you back into alignment. Why? Why? Because if Billy would have stayed in that shape, he would have been of no use whatsoever. He would have forever walked around with the remembrance of that injury. That injury would have defined who he was for the rest of his life. If it did not take the necessary or if he did not take the necessary means of getting that back into alignment. I don't know what that had to do with praise, but that was God gave it to me on the step there. So Luke 6, I'm trying to get through this. Luke 6, verse 40. We'll read 39 too. And he spoke a parable to them, can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. That word perfectly is the word katartizo. So everyone who is trained to get into alignment with what the end of their story is written will become like who? The teacher. Who's the teacher? Listen, you can't make this stuff up. How do you get more like him? Allow him to snap you back into alignment. Sometimes we get off. Sometimes it's by complete error on our part, and we just blew it, and I dropped the ball, and I need to be snapped back into alignment really hard. And sometimes I'm trying my best And I'm going for it, and I just went off on the wrong direction a little bit, and he's just easing me back in. It's not always as extreme as putting a five-gallon bucket on your bicep, filling it with water. Sometimes he lovingly, as he walks, 
I, I think about it like this. Whenever we walk through the parking lot, and I got and Haley's with us, and a lot of times she'll veer off, and I got to run over and grab her and just kind of stay with me in the parking lot. Just get her back in alignment. Why? Is it because I'm a mean dad and I don't want her to have any fun in the parking lot? No. It's because I know there's crazy drivers and I don't want her to get hit. I know that sounds funny and it sounds simple, but I mean, think about it. Is God pulling you in back into alignment because he's a mean God and he doesn't want you to have any fun? No, he is snapping you back into alignment. Why? Because he says, you're safer here. God, you're safer here with me. Okay, got a couple more and then I'm done, I promise. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He started off his letter with this one. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10 says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Here is Paul talking about a, an ecclesia, a family. And he's saying, what, how are you going to be a successful family? Get in alignment with each other. And that kind of goes with Galatians 6.1. So we'll go ahead and go there too. I don't hear any pages turning. Sorry. <laughs> Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you be also be tempted. So that word restore, the word katartizo, out of love, snap them back into alignment. You know, you, I, I was sitting there this morning, and I was praying. I was like, okay, God, I'm starting to understand where this is going. Starting to. I'm starting to understand... The basics, but why? Why now? Why, why, why? And you know what God told me? It's because you're going somewhere. And I need you together. If you got a train and you got half the cars trying to go in different directions, He's saying you're going somewhere. Y'all hook up a line. Listen, listen, I want you to take this, I want you to write this in your notes. That does not mean align with your pastor. You align with him. You, why? Because there's times where I'm going to veer off, and he's got to write me back into my story. Come on, you align with him. And it's an amazing, it's, it's so simple when you think about it, because if you align with him, and I align with him, and Randy aligns with him, we're all going to travel the same direction. So easy. So easy. Okay, last one. Hebrews. We're going to learn our books of the Bible this morning. Hebrews 13, 21. Once again, this is how... I was going to say he, but they don't really know who wrote Hebrews. This is how the author ended the letter. We'll start in 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That word complete is the word katartizo. It's going to make you in alignment. Get you back into alignment with your story. Why? Because the end of your story is the image of Jesus. He said, that's what your goal is. That's what I'm making you into. So for you to be complete, you've got to snap back into alignment. Amen? So one more time. For we, because we are His workmanship, fabricated into Christ Jesus, superimposed with Jesus for good works. That's so good. Bubba, you're so smart. 
You know what's amazing? Because, like, verse 9 is talking about you don't gain salvation by works, which means you can't do it on your own. Verse 10 is talking about if you'll put Jesus on top of you, the works come natural. <laughs> then not only will the Father see the blood and Jesus when he looks at you, the world will begin to see Jesus when they look at you. Superimposed. Such a cool word. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We should walk in alignment with them. So I'm going to ask you to get serious just for a moment. I know we've joked and cut up and we had a good time and I love doing that. Um, But I'm going to ask you to get serious just for a moment. And I'm going to pray over you. And I'm going to warn you beforehand that I'm going to pray that God do every means necessary to get us in full alignment with Him. I'm not saying that you're a wretched sinner and you need to get in. It's not what I'm saying. If you're a sinner, you do need to get in. But that's What I'm saying is anything. If the path is here and I'm walking here, I can get closer. Amen? So, if I'm going to ask everybody to stand. If you truly want this prayed over you, if you truly receive this prayer, I'm going to ask you to lift your hands. And we're just going to pray it. Amen? And you ain't got to listen to me. You can, you can pray your prayer. Abba, Father God, as we bow before you this morning, first of all, God, I want to thank you that you're faithful, that you're merciful that you're sovereign, that you're all-knowing. God, that you wrote the end of my story before I was ever even a thought in my mother's mind. God, that, that, that you finished my story then. So God, right now, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to do any means necessary to get me and keep me in alignment with what my story is supposed to be. Lord, I pray for every person that has their hands raised in this house. God, that, that from this moment, you're going to begin to do everything Every means necessary to get us in alignment with the end of our story. Because there's one thing we know is that we can trust that the end of our story is good. Lord, it may not always be enjoyable getting back into alignment. But God, I know that the end result is better if I'm in alignment with you. So God, we pray right now in Jesus' name that everyone with their hands raised and their hearts sincere... God, that you would begin to do any means necessary to get me in alignment with your story. Mm. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Me and Randy was talking at work. We don't say that word enough. Hallelujah. I read somewhere that that's like one of the only words in creation that has the same meaning no matter what language you're speaking in. Like every language, hallelujah means the same thing. Praise be to God. Isn't that cool? What's that mean? That means if you are get stationed in like the Congo and you don't know anybody, you got one word you can say that they're going to know. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So while you're standing and you can reach your pocket, we'll go ahead and take up our morning offering. You got to admit, that was funny. Like, somebody got to give me some props on that one. (laughs) Maybe not. I don't know. (laughs) I appreciate that, Matt. Abba, Father, God, as we bow before you one more time, God, we just want to bless this offering. God, we thank you for your provision. God, we thank you that your name is still Jehovah Jireh and you provide for us so well. So, Lord, we just want to honor that in giving back to you. So, God, I just pray that you bless each one that give. Lord, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, I know we had several birthdays. So, everybody who had a birthday, make your way to the front. Ha, 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 ha.